A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Save me, O Lord, in your kindness. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my rock of refuge, a stronghold to give me safety. You are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead and guide me. You will free me from the snare they set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. How great is your goodness, O Lord, which you have in store for those who fear you, and which, towards those who take refuge in you, you show in the sight of the children of men.
martyr's crown beneath the cross of the Lord. Dominus Fabesco, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Verbum Domini, Well, today we celebrate this beautiful universal memorial of Our Lady of Sorrows, smack in the middle of the month of September, huh? And you know that after Mass every day, we pray live the Rosary. And this month, following the Rosary, we've been praying the beautiful litany of Our Lady of the Seven Sorrows, an abridged version of it. It was written by Pope Pius VII. And so today is the memorial of Our Lady of Sorrows, this September 15th, that closes the little octave of this eight-day period, beginning with September 8th, Our Lady's Nativity, her being born from her mother's womb, St. Anne, which shows her entering into the world. We celebrate her immaculate conception in St. Anne's womb nine months before that, which is December 8th, right? December 8th to September 8th, a nine-month human gestation period. And then on September 8th, we celebrate her nativity, the Blessed Mother's nativity, entering into the world. And today... Now, eight days later on the 15th, we celebrate Our Lady of Sorrows, which is really the feast day, celebrated as a memorial, the feast day that shows the magnitude of the office of her divine maternity. She stood at the cross. It shows the magnitude of her office, capital O, the office of the divine maternity, which we celebrate when? January 1st the eighth day, the octave day of Christmas. December 25th, Christmas Day, the birth of Christ. Eight days later, January 1st, Mary, Mother of God. The great solemnity of Mary, Mother of God. The collect prayer at the closing of the penitential rite before the first reading is so beautiful. It continues the theme of yesterday, which is the feast day of the exaltation of the Holy Cross, which Father Joseph preached on so beautifully yesterday. It continues the theme in today's collect prayer for Our Lady of Sorrows. The words of the collect prayer said, O God, who willed that when your son was lifted high on the cross, his mother would stand close by and share in his suffering. It's right there. And what did we hear right after the psalm and its response, but before the gospel, Alleluia, the beautiful sequence chanted and sung by the choir, Stabat Mater, literally in the English from the Latin, standing mother. Help me out here. At the cross, her station keeping, stood the mournful mother weeping. Now, I know I've read this before, but on today's memorial, today's Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, it's especially apropos to read it today, I believe. It concerns the so-called swoon of the virgin devotion, 
the Latin rendered it spasmus virginis, spasm of the virgin. Now, I made mention of it lightly earlier in the week. I didn't read the, the whole thing, but I made reference to it. But in the past, I believe I've read this, but it's worth rereading today, and it's short, concerning the swoon of the virgin devotion. We all know what a swoon is, right? You swoon just before you completely faint and go out. Or a, a, a spasm, the spasmus virginis, the spasm of the virgin. In other words, spasming just before completely going out. Listen to this. In the Middle Ages, there developed a very curious devotion to the so-called spasmus virginis, or spasm of the virgin, or the swoon of the virgin. It is a theme in some medieval crucifixion iconography in which our Blessed Mother Mary is shown extremely grief-stricken, spasmodically swooning, and then literally fainting into the arms of St. John or one of the other holy women, Mary of Clopas or Mary Magdalene. But in 1503, the great Dominican theologian Cardinal Cajetan wrote a strong treatise against the so-called swoon of the virgin devotion. Among other things, he pointed out that it simply is not biblical. St. John the Evangelist clearly states in his gospel that Jesus' mother stood near his cross. Again, also think of the ancient Lenten hymn, Stabat Mater, Standing Mother, which served again as the, as the sequence for today, just before the gospel. That hymn comes to us from around 1275, 13th century. Cardinal Cajetan and others soon labeled the swoon devotion, quote, both scandalous and dangerous to the faithful, end quote. Don't you love it, the church guiding us like that? That the church being our mother and guiding us it toward proper devotion and what is not proper devotion? <laughs> what a guide. What a guide. Cardinal Cajetan labeled the swoon of the virgin devotion such because it simply was not consonant with our Blessed Mother's courageous behavior on that first Good Friday. Did she weep? Yes. Probably copious tears? Yes. Was she sorrowful? Yes. Today's feast day is called Our Lady of Sorrows. It's one of her 2,600 plus titles. But she did not swoon, spasm, faint, collapse, or go out completely. She did none of those things. Due to the works of Cardinal Cajetan and other notable theologians, Pope Julius II soon refused to attach any indulgences to the devotion whatsoever. Soon the church forbade artists to depict Our Lady fainting below the cross, and so it was then that the Spasmus Virginis devotion gradually disappeared altogether. O oh God who willed that when your son would be lifted up from the cross, his mother would stand close by and share in his suffering. Which tells us that she's standing near us when we have our own particular sufferings, in the plural, <laughs> whatever those might be, huh? The Blessed Virgin Mary was born to be the mother of God. The Blessed Virgin Mary was born September 8th, to be the mother of God. September 15th, standing at the cross, the fulfillment of her office of the divine maternity, capital O, celebrated in solemnity on January 1st every year. The Blessed Virgin Mary was born to be the mother of God, this beautiful octave. Remember I said, uh, not only is the triumph of the cross, the exaltation of the cross, a feast day yesterday on the 14th, but also the most holy name of Mary is celebrated within the octave on the 12th of September, usurp this year because the 12th was a Sunday, and the Sunday took precedence, the 24th Sunday in ordinary time for year B of the three-year cycle of Sunday readings, year A, year B, and year C, and we're currently in year B. How about 9-11? Falling historically now, annually, within this octave. What does that tell us? The evil that's in the world, 
I think it tells us our Blessed Mother wants to shield us from evil. Evil from without our country that comes to us from without and evil from within our country, like the culture of death. What else falls historically, annually, during the octave? On the 13th of September, the very, very, very first revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ to St. Faustina Kowalska as the divine mercy. What does that tell us? What does that tell us about the mercy of God? How about our Lord himself telling Faustina, I am giving you this devotion, my daughter, to prepare the world for my second coming. How about that? Right there in the diary. This is an important octave, my friends. This September 8th through the 15th. From the first moment of Mary's immaculate conception in her mother's womb, Our Lady has led us to her son. At the wedding feast of Cana, for example, she says, do whatever he tells you, John chapter two, verse five. And from the cross, Christ himself commands us, behold your mother. Today's gospel from John 19, verses 26 and 27. And as the Savior's dying gift to us, he gifts us Mary then. He gifts her to us, huh? He leads us back to Mary and she leads us to him. It's cyclical. For he knows we need the maternal closeness of the sorrowful mother to sustain us when we overcome by the terrifying trials, sufferings, and adverse effects of the woundedness of this life because of the original sin. Through Mary's compassionate presence at the cross, that event, as it recurs in our own lives, the cross, our crosses, becomes more deeply human, we could say filling us with the courage to face life's suffering, certain in the secure embrace of divine providence. Our Lord gifts us to Mary, but then she gifts us back to him and leads us back to him. Whenever we let Mary love us, she gives us Jesus. And by obeying the Lord in our devout beholding of the mother of God, we give Mary a welcome, literally, as a son or daughter, thereby fulfilling what our Lord asked of his own beloved disciple, John. Behold your mother. Those are words for us. He's telling you, he's telling you, he's telling you, he's telling me, hey, behold your mother. Don't you love the, the Catholic t-shirt that says, call your mother. She hasn't heard from you in decades and it's surrounded with a rosary. <laughs> you know, the decades of the rosary. <laughs> call your mother. She hasn't heard from you in decades. We need to love the blessed mother. The devil hates her, by the way. Are you aware of that? The devil hates her. Diary of, of, of an American Exorcist by Father or Monsignor Stephen Rossetti. He makes that point very, very clear. The devil can't stand the Blessed Mother. More reason to turn to her in this culture of death in which we live. I want to close with this, two virtues. We've talked about virtue this week earlier on. Two virtues that our Blessed Mother exhibited, and I close with this, the virtue of constancy and the virtue of longanimity. Remember, I talked about these two virtues on the memorial of St. John Chrysostom, also on the 13th. He's the saint that falls during the octave that we just celebrated now, this eight-day period, the octave of the Blessed Virgin from her nativity to her Our Lady of Sorrows celebration. How lucky is he, huh, to have his memorial fall during the octave? But I talked about he also, John Chrysostom, early church father, having the virtue of constancy and longanimity. In the older theological textbooks, you see the word longanimity. In the newer ones, you see the phrase long-suffering. But long-suffering or longanimity means the same thing. The virtue of constancy and longanimity was also practiced and lived by the Blessed Virgin Mary. Constancy, quote, the virtue enabling one to persevere in suffering or trials without giving in to despair and or apathy. No, with the acquired virtue of constancy, trials and distress are able to be withstood, with what? Stood, at the cross her station keeping, stood, the mournful mother weeping. With the acquired virtue of constancy, trials and distress are able to be withstood, when one prays for patience and courage and receives the sacraments often. And with the virtue of longanimity, 
or long-suffering. We have the good habit or virtue related to the virtue of hope that grants perseverance in the midst of trials, for example, suffering and distress, and because it's geared towards hope, it gears itself ultimately to the final end of the beatific vision. One with longanimity is blessed with equanimity, the virtue by which one possesses a balanced and positive outlook or attitude when confronting obstacles. So longanimity, that's why I like that phrase better than long suffering, because kind of, it's kind of poetic, huh? Longanimity leads to equanimity. Again, equanimity is a separate virtue by which one possesses a balanced and positive attitude when confronting obstacles. I don't know about you, but I want to ask our Blessed Mother that I can grow in constancy, longanimity, and equanimity in this culture in which I live and which I love. So, so much, so, so much do I love the modern day culture. I want to sanctify it. I want to make it holy. I want to lead it to Jesus Christ through his blessed mother. And that's the attitude we need to take on. But suffering's going to come because of it, because we stand up for truth. What a gift we have in our blessed mother Mary, our lady of sorrows. I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my sister Susie, whose birthday is today. Let us pray for Our Lady of Sorrows to guide us, to bless us, to lead us to her Son, to help us grow in the virtues of constancy, longanimity, long-suffering, and equanimity, to live our vocations, whether single, married, or as consecrated religious, or diocesan priests, or bishops, or widows, or widowers, to the best ability and way that we can truly being lights of her son, whose name we are baptized and confirmed in, who we receive in the Eucharist, in his real presence, body, blood, soul, and divinity, to make us that best version of self that we're called to be, to be his light in the modern world, so that we can be incarnations, if you will, incarnations of two things. Number one, be an incarnation of Jesus telling John, Behold your mother. Be an incarnation of that, that you embrace Mary. And secondly, that you'll be a personal incarnation of what Mary told the chief wine steward at Cana. Do whatever he tells you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Our Lady of Sorrows, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit,